Psalm 113. It's funny, I was, I was taking a nap the other day, and I dreamt this passage. I'd actually read it in the morning on my morning devotion, but I, I read about several other things that morning. But this one, I saw as clear as could be, Psalm 113. But when I took my nap, I took my nap praying about what it is God wanted me to share today. <laughs> and, and, and I couldn't get that out of my mind when I woke up. I said, okay, all right, God, this is, I, I'll, I'll, I'll work with it. And, but the neat thing is, as I studied about this passage, it's such a simple song. It's short, it's only nine verses long. And there's so much there, so much there. It's, it's, it's just amazing. I, I, I want to mention a, a resource I, I stumbled on. Uh, Matsu Kato has a book called Grace, More Than We Deserve, Greater Than We Imagine. More than we deserve, grace, more than we deserve, greater than we imagine. And, um, and, and I read an excerpt uh, from that online and wow, it's like, my gosh, this is one of the, the best worded devotionals I've ever read on the subject of grace. And so I wanted to share that because I, I, I'm not going to read from the devotional, I don't think. Um, but I, but I, um, um, there's so many things that stir up my heart that I'll probably be speaking from the devotional at times. <laughs> so I wanted to give some credit um, to, to Max Cato. Let's read Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. The praise the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Simple passage. One of the key scriptures out of this passage that stuck out to me was verse 6, where it says, Who humble himself, humbles himself, behold, the things that are in heaven and in the earth. The New International Version says, Who stooped. Who stooped. Okay? He looked down, and, and, and so I, I, I just get this image of God up in heaven just doing like this. <laughs> watching, watching his people. But there's so much more to it than that. This theme, I could call this sermon the stooping God. Because he stoops a lot. <laughs> he stooped for a long time. Even at the very beginning, he stooped down and walked in the garden with Adam. Okay, he, he, he has always wanted that re relationship with his his people. There's a, two, one thing before I forget, I've got to share. And I love this about this scripture. Psalm 113 to Psalm 118 is a section of scripture that the, the Jews have used at the Passover time for centuries. For centuries. It, it, it's the Psalm 113 and 114 that they said that the Jews would read that at the beginning of the Passover. And then Psalm 115 through 118 would be at the end of the Passover. And you may, may remember at the, at the Lord's Supper that it says at the end of the Passover feast that they sung the hymn. And then they went out to the Mount of Olives. So that this is this Psalm 113 almost certainly, okay, would have been one of the Psalms that Jesus and his disciples sang. And, and there's something really powerful about that for me. You know, something powerful about that. It, there's certain things. I have a friend who's actually a, a Catholic priest, and he visited Israel, and he shared with me after he, he was in Israel for like three months in some sort of 
um, kind of a devotional training, what it was exactly. But when he came back from Israel, he told me, he said, I went to the resurrected tomb, to the empty tomb, he said. I went to the, the empty tomb. He said, at the empty tomb, how many of you have been to Israel? Have any of you been to Israel? My goodness. Okay, you guys are blessed. <laughs> no. He said, at the empty tomb, there's a hole that you can reach into. Okay? He said, when I reached into the hole, I thought of your family. And I prayed for you. And boy, that just sent chills up and down my spine. <laughs> I know that God is present in all of our prayers now, but there was something about him being at the place where Jesus rose and praying that really, really touched my heart. That God would even bring me to his mind to pray for my family. He knows the number of the struggles that we've had with my daughter's health, and, and, and that, that just touched me. But when I read that Psalm 113 was one of those passages of Scripture that Jesus and his disciples sang, it's just, it's like we're able to participate in the Last Supper in a, in a special way, in that hymn. And, and it started out with these words of praising the Lord, praising us, as servants of the Lord, praising his name from this time forever we're to praise him. And he says, from the rising of the sun to where it sets, the people are to praise the Lord, that He's high above the heavens, His glory covers the, the, the whole heavens. From one end of the earth to the other, the glory of God is revealed to people. Romans says, and, and quoting from Psalms, in fact, it, 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 it talks about how the heavens declare the glory of God. That the speech, the speech goes forth declaring that God is real, that He's alive. In that manner without excuse because the testimony of creation says there is a God. There is a God. So I'm reading this and, I, and I'm reading about how he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and on earth. How he stooped down and looked on us. And I'm just thinking of the ways in which the Lord stoops. How he stooped into our lives. How he stooped down and came leaving glorious beauty perfection of heaven and coming through the Virgin Mary as a, an, an infant child. How he stooped down to walk among men so that he could identify with our weaknesses. So that he could connect with us in our struggles. It's beautiful. It's so powerful to think about how, how he's done that. And then Max Cato talked about the John 8 account of the woman caught in adultery. Remember that account where, where the, the religious leaders somehow knew that this woman was committing adultery? You know, I, I've often wondered how in the world that worked, that they happened to just know the right time to go in there, and they just happened to bring her out of the house. Who knows where the man is? It's like, why in the world did they bring him out? Bring him before Jesus. The law says we must stone this woman. Right? What did Jesus do? He stood down. He stooped down and he wrote the dirt. And I was, I was meditating on this. I was thinking about how many messages have we heard? I've heard messages over the years and different ideas and conjectures and something. He was writing, um, and ultimately he's writing the names of the people. <laughs> and their sins, maybe he was listing some of their sins. You know, who knows? I don't know what he was writing. I told you I wasn't going to quote from him, but I am. It just occurred to me. Max Cato had a little conjecture on this. Let's see. Mm. This is it. He said, I wonder what, what he wrote, right? Grace happens here. That's, that was his suggestion. Mm -hmm. I thought that was good. It's good. But who knows? But I love the fact that the Bible doesn't tell us. Because if it told us, then we want to think on the passage as much. We already know what it is. But because he didn't tell us, it causes us to meditate and to think and to wonder and to imagine. And, there's, and maybe he doesn't tell us because there, it, there's an infinite number of things that Jesus could have wrote on that dirt. But in the presence of this accused woman, this guilty woman, he stoops down, he writes, and he stands up. Let he is without sin cast the first stone. 
And he stoops down and starts writing in the dirt again. And one at a time. From the oldest, because they have more sins built up in their life, I think. <laughs> it don't take long, the older you get, to, to know that you're not there. To the oldest of the youngest, the oldest leave first. The oldest leave first. And finally, the youngest get the clue that they're not perfect either. And they leave. Where are your accusers? Says, I'm gone. So neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. God is stupid in so many ways in our lives. And so I'm reading this. He humbles himself to build the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And isn't that what he did for us? You know, when I, when I first was reading about the poor and the needy, I'm thinking of the destitute and the people that have no money and the people that are begging. And the, and, 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 and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, it's not just them. It's us. We are the poor and the needy. Spiritually destitute apart from Christ. Apart from what he did, lost. The poor and the needy. And he stooped down in love. He reached down. And he not only took on that human flesh and went to a cross and died for our sins and rose from the dead, but then he ensured that somebody came with the good news message for us. We would not be here in this room today if it were not for the fact that somebody declared to us the grace, the love, the tender mercy of Christ. And that just gets to my heart it's so deep. When I imagine if I'd been born in, in, in some other nation of the world where the light isn't as bright, born into a, a country where it's illegal to even own a Bible, born into a family that doesn't know God, the thought that I could actually have been born into a situation where I would enter into eternity not knowing the God who saved me is horrible. And it's one of the things I think is meant to drive the church, drive the church to tell the good news, to proclaim the good news, to, to hold out hope to the people around us, to demonstrate grace for the most lost, for the poor, for the needy, for those that are, are in an ash heap of this life and their life seems like it's, it's just a wreck and there's nothing left to it. There's always hope. I encounter people all the time who think that there's nothing left to live for. There's always something to live for in Christ. Always. There's always something. No matter, I, I love this Psalm 27. It's, it's a, a beautiful passage that has spoken my heart so many times over the years, and I've used with countless people. But that part of this, the passage you read, where it says, Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. So many people feel forsaken in this life. Broken relationships, broken marriages, broken families. Yet it says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord would receive me. Though the closest people in my life forsake or turn away from me, the, our loving Heavenly Father is there saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He stoops down and he ministers blessings. He ministers healings. You remember years ago they had that song, um, God is watching us, right? God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. Remember that song? I don't know who sang it. I don't remember anymore. It was a famous song. They played it all over the radio stations. Probably back in the 1980s. Um, now I thought, well, okay. But that's, that's, he's also watching so close. <laughs> So, I mean, he's, he's given angels charge of our lives, who are, who are involved in our lives to watch over us. He's given us his very presence. That if we yield our lives to him, he not only is watching us, but he's come to live within us. And, and so the truth is, he stooped down to become like us in humanity, but to remain sinless. And then to take our sins upon himself on a cross. 
And then the Bible says in Ephesians that we're seated with him in the heavens, in Christ. Because he stooped down, we have the blessing of being seated spiritually in a position of victory. As I heard one pastor's wife say, the woman named Benny Johnson, I love this word, it stuck in my heart so deep. She said, when we understand what Christ has done for us, when we understand our identity in Christ, we can pray from a place of victory instead of for victory. And there's a difference. Praying for victory, asking God for victory, we can pray from victory because as an inheritance right, as his sons and daughters, he's already purchased our victory. We can pray from that place in his throne room. Before the very throne of God, we can pray and begin looking at our lives and our circumstances through his eyes and through his perspective. And so we're praying from victory and thanking him that he's working instead of begging him to work. Thanking him that he's working, thanking him that he's healing, thanking that he's blessing thinking that he's going to do something beautiful, make something beautiful out of the, the struggles and the messes that we have in life. He is always working. Now, I don't mean everything's going to turn out just the way we want, because the perfection still is in heaven. But we can pray from our relationship with him and expect what God is doing to do something beautiful in our lives. When, when I was growing up, my, my dad often turned on um, Oral Roberts um, University, the, 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 the choir would sing. Remember that song? Something good is going to happen to you, happen to you this very day. Something good is going to happen to you. Remember the rest of it? Jesus of Nazareth is coming your way. Asking your way. I heard that song so many times, I still remember it. I'm 56 years old. <laughs> Beautiful song. It's so true. How often I think, He's here. When two or three come together in our midst, He's here. I say, Lord, let's just touch the hem of your robe and receive what we need for our lives, for our bodies, for, for our spirits, for our family members to touch the edge of your robe. What are you doing here? Lord Jesus. Jesus said he only did what he saw the Father do. He only said what he saw the Father say. So the key is being connected with him, being in deep fellowship with him so that you know what he's doing in a circumstance. But the faith rises up and says, even if I don't understand everything that you're doing here, Lord, I thank you that you are doing. You are working. You are blessing. I thank you, Father, that we are not alone in everything Life is scary. When, when, when my daughter went to the hospital because she was struggling to catch her breath, I didn't sleep great that night. <laughs> okay? That's the truth. Because every time I woke up, I was praying. I just kept praying. And I cannot imagine going through something like that without Jesus. I'm so glad that she knows Jesus. He makes all the difference. I want to read one last passage of scripture just to kind of wrap this up. Because I think it's like one of the ultimate passages about our stooping God. In fact, I believe it may have very well have been a hymn that the early church sang. It's from Philippians 2. Beginning with verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He stooped down. He humbled himself 
by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, it is at the name of Jesus that every knee is going to bow. And His name alone. His name alone. The malarkey that's coming out across so many churches where it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something is a complete contradiction to the Word of God. I heard a preacher say recently, he said, if America is not, if America is not careful, <coughs> We are in deep danger of the Bible being labeled as hate speech in this country. I said, he's right. He's absolutely right. Because people don't want to hear what it says and believe it. As soon as it judges their heart and their thoughts and their lifestyles, they want to say it's not right. But it's at the name of Jesus that every knee, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to come. It's just a question of whether we're going to confess and acknowledge Him and the glory of His majesty and His presence right before we go into His eternal presence or if we're going to acknowledge Him and confess and bow before Him before we go to eternal separation. He's stooped down out of love so that we can all know that we belong to Him and we can help others to know the same. Psalm 113, beautiful, beautiful passage. Take a few minutes maybe this week and read 113 through 118. Amazing how it all connects together. 118 actually contains prophetic words about Jesus. It's so interesting. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your amazing grace, your amazing love, for your incredible love and stooping down and rescuing us from our darkness. We, we carry your presence with us in every situation, every circumstance, Father. May we carry your presence. Because your presence is with us, always. But God, we want that presence to be manifested through us. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. The love that He gave Himself for me. Jesus, may it be true that for our lives that You are living through us and in us in an amazing way that we will be displaying Your grace, Your love, Your kindness, Your mercy, and holding up Your word of truth so that the people around us can live with hope and die with peace. True peace. Because they have encountered and surrendered to Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Father, for stooping down in love and rescuing us from the ash heap. Saving us and transforming us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, I pray you have a great week. And yeah, thank you for joining us. And remember, if you encounter folks in the home that don't have a place in the worship, invite them to join us. We love that out. So nice to see your faces today. No masks. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs>